Anyone can whistle. The cult classic flop of Sondheim fandom. Relegated to an existence in Sondheim jukebox cabarets, encores, concerts, and audition books of Juilliard graduates. It was Angela Lansbury's big break and Sondheim's big failure. But the question remains, why did this nine performance flop flop? Well, I've got some ideas. You're watching Musical Theater Mash. Anyone Can Whistle was Sondheim's quickest failure. It played for only nine performances in April of 1964, and we're talking financial failure here, flop in its purest sense, because there is no question that this musical has had a life beyond its initial run. Nowadays, it's a cult classic among Sondheim fanatics. Sondheim puts the original failure very succinctly in finishing the hat. It took him 33 backers auditions to raise the money, a longer run than the show. Most reviews were very poor. An often quoted New York Times review says, there is no law against saying something in a musical, but it's unconstitutional to omit imagination and wit. In an attempt to be meaningful, anyone can whistle forgets to offer much entertainment. So why did it flop? Uh, trying to track down one specific reason feels a little bit like trying to nail jello to a tree, but in my research, I came across a laundry list of ideas. Sondheim himself attributes much of the failure to Arthur Lawrence's director-writer position. With no third book writer voice to bounce ideas off of, you become attached to your own perceived cleverness. You overestimate yourself. Potential producer David Merrick was wary of Lawrence from the get-go and refused to produce if Arthur was going to direct. Contemporary critics, and later Steve himself, cite a smug, flippant, musical versus audience tone as turning audiences off. The ending of Act One overtly and explicitly mocks the audience in the theater. In the sometimes bombastic on Sondheim, Ethan Morden suggests, among other things, that the pre-Broadway tryout in Philadelphia may have doomed the musical from the start. The show has a zany, fanciful premise, and Philadelphians are notoriously resistant to offbeat material. Angela Lansbury herself speaks of the frantic and destructive rehearsal process. I, I, I didn't sing for a year after an, anyone can whistle closed. There's even the theory that the musical was cursed. Uh, Pre-Broadway cast member Harry Lasko had a heart attack and passed away. And in Philly, a dancer fell into the pit and gave a string player a fatal concussion. All of these things very likely played a factor. As well as the falling out of style three-act musical structure, failure to clearly define a premise in the first ten minutes, and other well-discussed script-level problems. But I think there's something being overlooked. So I haven't mentioned the plot yet. Here is Sondheim's quick overview from Finishing the Hat. A fanciful story about a small, economically depressed American town whose venial mayoress gets the bright idea of arranging a fake miracle to attract tourists. The tourists arrive, but they become intermixed with the inmates of the cookie jar, a rest home for nonconformists. Farcical complications ensue. Nonconformists. I think no matter which way you cut it, the plot of Anyone Can Whistle revolves around these nonconformists. All of the mayoress's antics, Nurse Faye's motivations, Hapgood's division of the crowd during the masterpiece of a song Simple, even whatever it is Sondheim and Lawrence were smugly trying to say, all revolve around our assessment of the nonconformist cookies from the cookie jar. In a nutshell, this is a story asking what differentiates these nonconformists from the normal population of this small town. And spoiler alert, there are fewer differences than you'd think. But what did Sondheim and Lawrence mean when they called this group of cookies nonconformists? Well, this is where it gets interesting. 1950s and 60s America post-World War II and enjoying the economic boom that followed. We're in Leave it to Beaver territory here. The world of golly gee whiz, housewives, businessmen, suburbs, and where you expressed your individuality by the color of your Frigidaire. Meanwhile, 
counterculture festers. This was the Beat Generation. Allen Ginsberg, William S. Burroughs, Jack Kerouac, bongo-playing beatniks, spiritual and sexual liberation, potential communism. These were the two groups Anyone Can Whistle was satirizing. Cora, her cronies, the pilgrims and the townspeople, the so-called normal conventional cleaver family types. And opposite them, the crazy nonconformist beatnik cookies, with their vocal defender Faye Apple and the secret nonconformist Hapgood. But here's the catch. While Sondheim and Lawrence were having Faye Apple defend these crypto beatniks as people too, and while Hapgood was pointing out there's not much difference between the bongo players and the normies, the actual beatniks had moved on. Kind of. As most social movements go, it's all very complicated. And this is a vast oversimplification. But by the mid-1960s, the emerging counterculture du jour was no longer the beat generation. They had given way to the hippies. While Sondheim and Lawrence were opening Anyone Can Whistle, Rado and Ragney were writing their early drafts of hair just down the street. Sondheim and Lawrence were attempting to capture and comment on the counterculture they felt around them. They were just one movement too late. This, I think, combined with the hostility the musical showed its audience, gave theater goers nothing to relate to. The square housewives and businessmen wouldn't dare equate themselves with the evil Mayor Escora, and the hippies couldn't see themselves in the beatnik-stained nonconformists of the cookie jar. It turns out nobody fit into Group A or Group 1. Sondheim and Lawrence certainly had no way of knowing that their cookies were transforming into hippies, but maybe, just maybe, if they ended the show in bell bottoms and tie dye, anyone can whistle might have found its audience. Possibly. As I said, it feels like nailing jello to a tree. I will leave you with this quote from Sondheim in 1995. Anyone Can Whistle was being dusted off for an AIDS benefit concert, and the Associated Press interviewed him about the now three decades old show. Steve says, it is a show that is better on records than it is on stage, because the issues it satirizes are no longer relevant. Its primary subject was nonconformity. Four years later, it was 1968, and everybody nonconformed. And being a nonconformist was, in its own way, conformity. <laughs>